Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak on how pride can take us on a perilous ride and how pride can hamper us materially and spiritually. So in the Bhagavad Gita in the 16th chapter, Krishna talks about the qualities of the divine nature and the demoniac nature. So first three verses, he describes a list of the divine qualities. Abhayam, Sattva, Samshuddhi, Jnana, Yoga, Vivasthiti. He goes on giving the list for three verses. In the fourth verse, he talks about pride. He talks about the demoniac qualities. Dambho, Tarpo, Bhimanascha, Krodha, Parusha, Mevacha, Agyanam, Chabhijatasya, Partha, Sampadam, Asurim. So, when he gives us demoniac quality, people of demoniac qualities, list their qualities, basically, he says that there are broadly two kinds of people. Some people are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> so, some people are godly and some people are ungodly. Some people are demoniac. So now, how do, you def how do we define somebody who is demoniac? It's not necessary that somebody has to have horns coming out of their head or teeth coming out of their mouth. Actually, uh, the essence of a person is not their appearance. It is, their, it is their activities which come from their qualities. So when Krishna describes the qualities of the demoniac people, the first three which he describes, he gives a list, Dambho, Darpo, Abhimanascha. Then he says, Krodha, Parusha, Evacha. So Krodha is straightforward. What does it mean? Anger. Parushya is harshness. Harshness especially in speech. And an Agyana is? What is Agyana? Ignorance. Krodha, Parusha, Agyana, Chavijatasya, Partha, Sampada, Masuri. So these three are quite distinct qualities. But the first three which Krishna describes, they are very striking. And what he says essentially over there is, Dambha, Darpa and Abhiman. Now all these three can seem similar. Pride, conceit, arrogance. That's how Srila Prabhupada translates them. But <clears throat> it can be understood at a deeper level. Each of them has its own characteristics. Dambha, Darpa and Abhiman. So Dambha refers to, all of these are variants of pride. Now the word pride can have sometimes a positive connotation also. That means that some, when it is used in the sense of honor, say for example a team has, a cricket team has lost a series and the last one match is remaining, they say we will play for pride. That means we don't want to be whitewashed, we don't want to lose completely, at least something will be, so play for pride. So their pride is used positively in the sense of honor. I, I want to have some sense of honor and this sense of honor is not bad. So when Krishna is talking about pride, when he uses these words, Dambha, Darpa and Abhiman. So <clears throat> now if we consider the common list of six anarthas, the six inner enemies, it's described as Kama, Krodha, Lobha. Moha, Madha and Matsarya. So Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Lust, Anger and Greed. Moha is illusion. Madha is intoxication. It just comes like pride. Matsarya is envy. So now in that list, the word Madha is there. Sometimes we also use the word Ahankar for arrogance, for ego rather. So let's try to understand what Krishna is talking about here by using these three qualities. And then we'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about from the Mahabharata, how some characters exhibit these qualities and how they may manifest in our life and how we can counter that. So now Dambha, Darpa, Abhiman. So Dambha refers to showing qualities which one doesn't have only. Like pretending to have some quality which one doesn't have. Sometimes say in India and in Mumbai we have our temple in Juhu, which is very close to the area where many Bollywood stars stay. So sometimes the Bollywood stars and other celebrities, they come to the temple. But they come only on Janmashtri. 
once a year. And some of them might be having a very devoted heart and that's when they are able to come. But many others, when they come, actually for them it's primarily a photo op. They'll take a photo and they say, Anjan Master, I went to his temple. And they'll put it on their Facebook, on their Instagram. And people will think, oh, such a nice person. He's so pious also. He or she is so pious. So now, whether they are coming to have darshan of Krishna or give darshan of themselves to others. <laughs> now, who knows that? So, somebody may have no piety at all. But did you see, in a pious society, it is good to look pious. So then, Dambha means one doesn't have quality, but one pretends to have qualities. One pretends. So, we could, there could be probably three possibilities. One has qualities and one conceals them. One has qualities and one exhibits them. One has qualities, one doesn't have qualities, but still parades, acts as if they have qualities. So that is Dambha. Now, Darpa is where one has qualities and one delights in exhibiting those qualities to others. And <clears throat> where the idea is that sometimes, say in sports matches, many times some sports players, say in, in cricket, a, a, a team is in a winning position. And then you just need to play intelligently, just hit some, maybe just in the last few overs, just hit some singles. And they are in a winning position, they can win easily. But then sometimes some players, instead of playing for the team, they play for the gallery. They play for the gallery means they want to hit a boundary, they want to hit a sixer, they want to hit some memorable shots and exhibit their skills. And in that, they get out. And the team slides from a winning position and ends up losing. So Darpa, is where one wants to make an exhibition of the qualities one has. Whether that exhibition is required or not, often it is not required, but one wants to make an exhibition. And Abhiman is where one is very praise conscious. One demands that others praise me. There are, there are VIPs sometimes in some parts of the world where those VIPs, if anybody is coming to meet them, they have a secretary. And the secretary's primary purpose is not to organize the schedule of the VIP. It is to, to inform all the guests who are coming to meet the VIP about the glories of that VIP. In case you are not aware, you should know this person has done this, 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 this. And they actually pay such a person for that. So for eulogizing, so they just they are so just so desperate that that people should glorify me. Sometimes some people they in English they are saying they are fishing for compliments. <laughs> fishing for compliments means whatever they have done, they just want somebody to, to praise them for that. At one level, wanting appreciation for something that I have done, that we have done, is just a natural human desire. But to let one's whole consciousness be driven just by the desire for appreciation. Mm -hmm. That can become a problem. In fact, psychologists call this a approval addiction. Approval addiction means somebody in their childhood, say there were two siblings and one of the siblings was compared unfavorably with the other sibling. And then throughout their life, that sibling who was unfavorably com compared by the parents or other relatives, is, is trying to gain the approval of that person. And their whole life being dri gets driven simply by that need. So, we may not call this demoniac. It's not demoniac in the sense that these people are going to do terrible things. But it's just that when our emotions start making us lose perspective of things, what is more important and what is less important? So, when that happens, that is the time when we start acting out of proper boundaries. In every relationship, there are bonds and there are boundaries. Bonds means what brings two people together. But even when two people come together, each person needs there to have their individuality, their space. 
and that space is defined by the boundaries between them as well as the boundaries around them. If we enter into any relationship, these bonds and boundaries are important in that. Say, if somebody gets married, then marriage means a bond between two people, but then there's also a boundary. Before marriage, maybe a uh, man can hang, hang out with different women or a woman can hang out with different men while dating or whatever. But after that, there are some boundaries that come. So what differentiates between the godly and ungodly is not, as I said, some external demonic, ungodly appearance. It is the respect for the boundaries. Those, who, for example, if you consider in the, in the Ramayana, Ravan was also ruling Lanka quite reasonably well. He had made Lanka a prosperous city and prosperous kingdom in fact and he was sharing the prosperity with his citizens. Of course he had the biggest chunk but he was sharing it. But then he did not respect the boundaries wherein Sita was already wedded to someone else. When he was captivated by the desire for her, his lost sense of all perspective. And not only was he acting unrighteously, but he was also un acting, acting in a cowardly way. He did not confront Ram. He went behind Ram's back, hatching a whole conspiracy for that purpose. So basically, all of us have certain boundaries within which we are all meant to function. Now these specific, the specifics of the boundaries may vary from person to person. But broadly speaking, these boundaries are what enable a society to function in a civilized way. If you look at the Mahabharata, Dhritarashtra was as much a victim as a victimizer. He was a victim in the sense that he was born blind. And thus he could say victim of fate, victim of circumstance. And he had to learn to accept that. Okay, this is the limitation that has come in my life now. He as a blind person could not become the king. Now that did not mean that he did not have royal privileges, he did not have royal comforts, he did not have royal honor. He had it all. He just could not have the royal throne. But some people, they crave for some particular honor so much that their whole life goes in that itself. Some people spend their whole life fighting battles that have already been lost. Fighting battles that have already been lost. In fact, when I sometimes address people, I have a physical handicap, I have a polio. Sometimes I address people who have physical handicaps and I try to share some spiritual wisdom. And when I talk with many of them, one thing that strikes me is that many of them after years of getting that that handicap or that issue, there appear, they are still fighting that battle. Why did this happen to me? They're still unable to accept that. And that wastes so much of their emotional energy. But there are two different there are congenital deformities and then there are adventitious or those which are caught in the later course of life. Generally, if somebody is congenitally limited in any way, whether it is uh, they can't see properly, can't walk properly, can't hear properly, then they have never known any better life. So for them to accept it is not that difficult. But somebody has lived normally and then they lose. Then it's very difficult for them. And sometimes, if that desire, any desire, in principle we can say no desire is intrinsically bad. But it is only when the desire crosses boundaries that it becomes bad. That everyone, we all have a desire to eat. It's a natural desire. And we all have our preferences in eating. But when for our food, we start hurting and killing other living beings, then that is unwanted. When we start eating so much that our health gets spoiled by that, that is a problem. So desires are just a feature of the living condition. And similarly, a desire to be accepted, a desire to be respected, that is also a normal desire. And as we grow in our life, we all want a sense of identity. Who am I? 
not in the ultimate philosophical existential sense, that we understand I am a soul. But while going through our life, we want a functional identity. Okay, I am an engineer, I am an NRI, I am this and that, I am a student, I am a software engineer, I am a doctor. We all need a sense of identity. That is natural. But where it becomes unnatural is when it starts crossing boundaries. So all of us at one time were just small unicellular organisms. Or organisms in our mother's womb. This one single cell. From there we have grown and there are millions of cells which comprise our body right now. And continuously we keep growing. So growth is natural to the living condition. But cancer is also a type of growth. If growth is natural, then why is cancer unnatural? That is because in cancer, the growth crosses boundaries. The growth becomes disproportionate. So one set of cells start growing so much that they start damaging the overall body. First the immediate vicinity and then they spread throughout the body and damage and they can even destroy the body. So growth, when it becomes disproportionate, when it crosses boundaries, it becomes destructive. Similarly, our need to be accepted and respected, when that crosses boundaries, what do I mean by the need crosses boundaries? That means that craving becomes so strong that we become ready to do anything and everything to fulfill that screen. That is when it becomes unhealthy. It can even become disastrous. So in Dhritarashtra's case, when he had the desire, I should get the royal throne. And he says, if I can't get it, then at least let my son get it. And his son, for all parents, the children are their dreams. For him, Duryodhana, having his first son, was his dream. And he just somehow or the other wanted to satisfy Duryodhana. And in that desire to satisfy Duryodhana, he ended up becoming, he ended up going along with Duryodhana's demonic schemes. So we could say in the Mahabharat, hmm, <coughs> Dhritarashtra is the cons consenting villain. He gives consent. Whatever you want to do, is a consenting villain. Shakuni is the scheming villain. He comes up with all the schemes. Do like this, do like that, do like that. And Duryodhan is the, you could say the star villain. If you want to have a, is the main villain who actually is the executing villain. He is the person who actually acts. He does various things. And he has his sidekicks. Dushasana is like his sidekick who does some of his demonic plans. So Duryodhan, when, some, he, when he wants, when he wants the honor of being the prince and then the king and then the emperor, this craving is natural. But as I said, when it starts crossing boundaries, that's when it becomes dangerous. So Dhamma, Dharpa, Abhiman, all of these, the result of, these are all different variants of that same disproportionate desire to be recognized by the world. The desire to be recognized by others is fine. But the disproportionate desire, that is, that is dangerous. So let's look at two, three different incidents from the Mahabharata to illustrate how this cancer spread within Duryodhan and through Duryodhan it affected many many others. So when the anarthas come within us, lust, anger, greed, envy, pride, illusion, when these come within us, the <clears throat> they all first of all hurt us and they make us act hurtfully towards others. So they hurt us. Initially, 
the how they are hurting us we may not be able to see it initially we may just end up hurting others because of them but i'll talk later about how they hurt us from a spiritual perspective as a material perspective but the <clears throat> as is generally normally when cancer appears cancer is not is very easily detected it's only when starts it starts growing disproportionately and then it starts impeding normal functioning of the body then we start feeling some pain we start sensing some swelling we start feeling something wrong and that is not just the presence of the cancer it is the cancer as it affects other parts of the body and some cancers they don't affect other parts of the body till they go to very advanced stage and that's why it's very difficult to detect them so similarly these anarthas unless we are introspective to check their presence check has two senses check means evaluate whether they are present and check means to restrain them both well both check their and if we are not introspective it is only when they start coming out in destructive ways that's when we will notice them so the most heinous way the most reprehensible way in which uh, duryodhan's pride came out was when he tried to dishonor draupadi the desire for wealth is greed the desire to have an attractive partner we could say is lust but underlying all of these is pride so now if you see the duryodhan had swindled through a rigged gambling match and had got all the property of the pandavas so he could have been satisfied with that so the desire to have money you could say it is natural the desire to have money when it becomes so great that it dominates our life and it drives all other important things out of our consciousness then it is becoming it becomes greed but the desire to have more money than someone else and to thereby get more recognition than them that is not greed that is pride that is pride so now when he drashtra told duryodhan before the gambling match so why do you want to gamble with the pandavas gambling will lead to fighting he said what are you lacking you you have a kingdom at that time the kingdom was divided into half the pandavas pandavas had their half the kauravas had their half he says you have kingdom you have followers you have everything that a person could dream what he said how can a his reply is very revealing of his pride he said how can a person be happy when his rival is more successful than him it's a very sad situation to be how can a person be happy when his rival is more successful more prosperous more uh, well known than him so i once saw an advertisement it was of a car and there was this young man driving a car and there was a young girl looking at him <coughs> admiring eyes and in the background there was another young man looking glaring at him frowning and glaring and the advertisement was ride this car and enjoy the envy in your neighbor's eyes <laughs> <laughs> now it is such a sad kind of enjoyment it is not even enjoy the car ride it is enjoy the envy in your neighbor's eyes and tomorrow if your neighbor gets a better car than you then the neighbor will enjoy the envy in your eyes <laughs> where will this end there is this is this kind of this kind of happiness all of us have to get happiness from somewhere where we get happiness from depends on our definition of happiness so for somebody who defines their happiness in terms of proving their superiority over others for that person it's it's a very unstable situation so when duryodhan got he he had his own wealth but he wanted more wealth than the pandavas it was not just more wealth than the pandavas it is, we could say 
there are three gunas in material nature. Three, three, three gunas. Which are the three gunas? Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. So I explain this in, uh, in terms of this possessiveness. You could say to want our share is Sattva. To want the biggest share, that is Rajas. If there is property being divided, say, uh, parents have passed on or whatever, and to want, let's all of us divide equally. That's Sattva. I want the biggest share. That is Rajas. I want everything. That is Tamas. That means that I don't even want any the other person even to exist practically. I want everything for myself. So that is what Duryodhan did. He, what did he do? He defrauded the Pandavas of everything through the gambling match. Now, what was he going to gain by it? It was not that he was going to enjoy that kingdom. He already had a good enough kingdom. But he wanted to see the misery of the Pandavas. And then after that, he had Shakuni pressure and manipulate Yudhishthir. So they gambled the Pandavas themselves. The Pandavas became slaves. Then Draupadi was gambled. And then Draupadi was also lost. Now Draupadi and the Pandavas became the servants, the slaves practically, of the Kauravas. Now after that was what he did was most heinous. Everything was reprehensible. This was most reprehensible. As I said, that the demoniac nature means those which are normal human drives, they go beyond all civilized boundaries. So then he tried to dishonor Draupadi by disrobing her. Now actually, if you consider this, if at all, now before Draupadi Swayam were, Duryodhana had also been a suitor at that time. He had also been a competitor to gain a kind of hand and he had been defeated. So he might have had still some desire for her. She was very beautiful. But if that had all been involved, that was all that was involved, then he could have sated that desire in private. When he wanted to dishonor her publicly, that was not so much lust as pride. This is how much I can humiliate you. That I can dishonor your wife in public. So when pride goes to such extent, it can make people forget even basic human decency. People can become bestial. Similarly, when there is sexual violence, it is not so much about lust. Lust is there. But when people have lust, they can, they can just go to some places where they can pay some money and get their lust fulfilled. But when there is violence, aggressive sexual assaults, it's not so much about lust as about pride. It's about power. This is how I can dominate you and I can use you. So basically, pride is the, you could say, all the anarthas are present, but pride is what makes all these other things go beyond all limits. Lust is there, greed is there, anger is there. We all get angry at times. But when our pride is wounded, then when we become angry, it becomes disproportionate. It becomes outrageous. When a person feels scorned, then the anger that results can cause devastation because it's wounded pride. So we can see across the world, even in today's world, it is pride uh, in, in the negative sense, not in the positive sense of honor, but pride in the negative sense of arrogance. That is the cause of so much violence, whether it is at a family, in, between the family, between siblings, between castes, between, between religions, between countries. It's often a matter of pride. And I want to prove my superiority over you. And, and now from all this is, we have just been discussing from the material perspective. Even materially, pride will make people do terrible things. Extremely destructive things. Uh, some people even say that that the current president of America, he had no interest in being the president. But the previous president of America, in a public event, humiliated him. 
and because of that humiliation he decided i am going to get your post and he started working and then he he grabbed that post although whether he is really qualified for it whether he can actually work as that's all are debatable issues but from a businessman he came here it is because of wounded pride so now of course i am not commenting on politics here I'm just giving examples to show how pride pervades all like aspects of our life and when people become proud or when people the, the three things over here when is we all have a natural desire to uh, as i said to want recognition but when that desire goes beyond normal limits civilized limits that's when it becomes dangerous so there's a need for appreciation need for recognition but then there is it becomes a craving where it makes us do terrible things and then if somebody refuses to fulfill that craving then how dare you do like this if he refuses to fulfill that craving then people go mad after that so people can do anything if you consider america uh, european history uh, then germany was able to so hitler was able to make all of germany into nazis nazism is primarily because after the first world war when the allies won they imposed the treaty of versailles which was had a lot of humiliating terms for germany and the humiliation from there that made them so that made them very vulnerable to be manipulated so when he triggered nazi pride we are the most powerful race and we are meant to rule the world germany is a small country for it to be able to rule the whole world it's quite unrealistic but then somehow because people's pride the pride had been wounded and they wanted some way to get a sense of honor again but that went beyond all such all, all could say even human limits where they started started uh, destroying uh, jews and other people and then they uh, the bloody the bloodiest war in recent history happened so from a spiritual perspective what is pride pride as i said pride can take on us on a on a perilous ride but once we get caught in pride how far we'll go where we'll fall what we will do we ourselves cannot know that from a spiritual perspective among all the anarthas lust anger greed envy pride and illusion pride is often considered to be the most dangerous because all the other anarthas they actually make us feel humble and they make us feel the need for god if we if we become too angry at times if we become too lusty at times if we become too greedy at times then we understand this is not good and i need to purify myself and how do i purify myself i have to take shelter of krishna so all the other anarthas they make us feel the need for krishna whereas pride it actually kills or sabotages destroys our need for krishna i am so good why do i need anyone else why do i need anyone else i am good so pride in that sense is the one anartha that is the most vile most damaging for devotion because the very basis of connecting with krishna feeling the need for him that itself is sabotaged by pride that itself is you could say a bomb is put under it and explodes from below so um is it was it right uh, which which brought the rhythm down or was it this urge for revenge or something like okay i'll come to that yeah so <clears throat> answer towards the end so the, now when we talk about pride uh, at one level we we need to recognize that these whenever we do any kind of analysis and we give any kind of names any this is this whole field is called taxonomy taxonomy is the system of classification a taxonomy is never watertight see on a map we may see that okay this is america this is canada this is the canada this is america here there is mexico here there there is this country now on the map on the map we may see neat dividing lines but actually if you go to the land there no no lines 
of an a river may separate two parts, but then which half of the river belongs to whom? There's there no line in the river also. Mm -hmm. So any system of classification, it is conceptual. When we translate the conceptual conceptual classification into literal reality, there are always nuances. So is this a part of Canada? Is this part of America? There can be disputes about that. Is this a part of India? This is a part of Pakistan. There can be disputes about that. So similarly, when we are when when we talk about pride, anger, greed, and we pride in, and envy, illusion, whatever last times are all these, these are basically we could say systems of classifying human behavior, names or labels which we use to contextualize and analyze human behavior. Now it's uh, now which particular behavior specifically originates from where. So some, now we could say envy and pride are two sides of the same coin. When I have a great overpowering craving for recognition, and if somebody else is recognized and recognized more than me, then it becomes unbearable. <coughs> then I may so Duradhan is often associated with envy. So if, if at a particular frame of analysis, we could use Duradhan as a symbol of envy. Sometimes we could use Duryodhana as a symbol of, as I said, pride. Arrogance especially, I was talking about pride and arrogance, because he was not ready to take any advice from anyone else. So, Dambha means to act, as I said, when we don't have any qualities, to pretend that we have those qualities. So, he was not very wise, but he rejected the advice of the wise. He was advised by Bhishma, by Drona, by Vidura. He was advised even by Vyasa and Maitreya and even Parashuram came and uh, so many other sages advised him. And if you consider these sages, he might have thought Bhishma is partial to the Pandavas, Drona had been partial to the Pandavas. But the sages from the forest, they had no vested interest at all. They were not going to gain anything based on who ruled the kingdom. So at least he would have considered their advice. So now, if we can go deeper into this, that, a, as I said, pride is, is, is what fundamentally disconnects us from Krishna. And all other anarthas, they can make us uh, feel the need for Krishna, but pride makes us feel, I don't need Krishna. Why do I need Krishna? So when that happens, when Krishna even showed the Vishwarup to, to, to Duryodhana, when he came as a Samti Dut, Duryodhana simply said, okay, hey, Krishna just showed some magic. Krishna just showed some magic. And he paid no attention to Duryodhana Krishna at all. He did not recognize Krishna's power at all. And thus he ended up ruining himself. So how do we deal with pride? I'll conclude with this last part and then we can have some questions. So fundamentally, pride arises Half an hour more. Okay, I'll finish and we can have question answers. Thank you. So, a pride arises fundamentally from insecurity. Insecurity means that when we feel that I am not good enough, that nobody values me or nobody will value me, that is the time when we start seeking valuation by others. Most of the people who are very arrogant and abrasive externally, often they are very insecure internally. And it is that insecurity that needs to be addressed. So Duryodhana, if we look at his story, the Pandavas initially were living in the forest. Because Pandu had retired to the forest and the Pandavas were born in the forest. At that time, it was not even known, it was not even sure whether Pandavas, Pandu would have any children or not. So when, or even if Pandu had children, because Pandu had retired to the forest, whether his sons would come back to the, and rule the kingdom, nothing was clear. So Duryodhana, when Duryodhana was born, it, he became the presumptive heir. It was expected that he will become the next king. And naturally, because of that, he grew up as a pampered child. He enjoyed the attention that everybody gave him. 
But when the Pandavas came back after Pandu's untimely death, at that time, because the Pandavas were new in the family, in the kingdom, and because along with the along with that, the Pandavas, because they had because because they had grown up in the forest where they had associated with Brahmanas and sages, the Pandavas were also very gentle and cultured. So on one side they were new, second they were gentle and cultured. So because of that, very quickly the attention and affection of the courtiers and the citizens shifted from Duryodhan to Yudhishthir and the Pandavas. And therein lay the seeds of Duryodhan's animosity. Of course, Duryodhan had an envious mentality from the past also, in that terms of he was of an ungodly bent of mind. But <clears throat> from previous life, he was actually sent by the Rakdanavas to take over the earth. But we can analyze from a human perspective for our purposes. So from that point of view, he started going forwards. So it was his hurt pride. I, I was getting this honor. Why is he getting this honor now? From that point, he went on. He tried to poison Shaku, poison Bhima, fed him a poison food and tried to have him eliminated. Now, this actually happened even before Shakuni came in his life. So he had the demoniac mentality before. Shakuni only fanned it further. But then it just grew, 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 grew. Now even for his desire, oh, you have taken my kingdom. It was never his kingdom. He was expected to get it, but he didn't get it. Now, it was never that he lost the kingdom. He got his half of the kingdom. But he was not happy with the half. It was his pride. I want more than what you have. In fact, I want all of it. So it is that insecurity which is the cause of pride. And as long as the insecurity is not addressed, no matter what we do, we will not be able to deal with pride. We will not be able to heal pride. <clears throat> so sometimes some people do things to increase their self-esteem. Just uh, about last month I have spoken in Stanford. So I was in Silicon Valley. So there I was speaking with a professor. And this professor from... Is talking about the psychology of students who are in the Ivy League universities. He said that he was taking an interview of a student who was very depressed. So basically, this professor was a part of the mental health counseling team. He said that some of these students they basically go through two emotions, broadly speaking. One is megalomania. Or you could say, megalomania means I am so great, grandeur. And the other is depression. So one student told him that half of the time when I can see how I am better than other students, I feel good about myself. And half of the time when I see that other students are better than me, <laughs> then I feel miserable. So now we live in a competitive world. We can't avoid that. And we will be ranked by society, by our education system, in competitive terms. That's also a fact of life. Everybody cannot come first in the class. But, and that will be a part of our identification. But if that becomes our whole sense of self-identity, then it becomes very, very difficult to have any steady sense of confidence, steady sense of self-worth. So when we start working as professionals, for many of us, our self-worth may become equal to our net worth. Depending on how much I am earning, that's what I am worth. And if I lose my job, or if a competitor gets starts earning more than me, people will start feeling very insecure because of that. So this insecurity comes because we have, we have identified ourselves with something material and external to us. The Bhagavad Gita helps us to shift our sense of identity back to where it belongs. The Gita explains that every one of us is a soul. As a soul, we are a part of the whole. The whole is known by different names and different traditions and is known by the name Krishna. 
in the Bhagavad Gita. So we have an eternal relationship with Krishna. And Krishna is eternally with us. We don't have to do anything to attract Krishna's attention or affection. Krishna always loves us, no matter what we do or what we don't do. Sarvasya chaham rudisan niveshto says, I am in the hearts of all living beings. Surudam sarva bhutana I am the well-wisher of everyone. Krishna is not just the lover of his devotees, he is the well-wisher and benefactor of all living beings. And this relationship with Krishna has to be the foundation of our identity. We have broadly two kinds of relationships in the world. One is horizontal relationship with others and vertical relationship with Krishna. And pride comes when in our horizontal relationship with others, we seek to prove ourselves to be better than them. And then we do various things to prove that we are better than them. But if we are secure in our vertical relationship, if we are sheltered in that, then we won't be so dependent on external trophies, external markers, external medals. And the connection with Krishna is not just an abstraction. Oh, I am a soul, I am a part of Krishna. This connection is a living experience. And that living experience is provided by the process of bhakti. So bhakti pareshanu bhava viraktir anyatra chava. Krishna says, Bhakti is the process that delivers experience of Krishna. Para Isha Anubhav. The Anubhav, the experience of that Lord who is transcendental. We get that by the practice of Bhakti. And Anubhav, experience. So, when we experience Krishna, what does it mean? We experience peace, we experience love, we experience security, we experience joy. Right now, all of us are like spiritually asleep. So we can't pursue Krishna directly with our eyes. Say there is a small baby who is sleeping. Now, when the baby is sleeping, say the, it suddenly becomes cold and the baby starts shivering. Now, the mother sees it and the mother may put a comforter on the baby. The, the baby is still asleep and she has not opened her eyes. But suddenly, at one moment she was feeling cold and now she starts feeling comfortable. Now she infers from that. Oh, my mother must be here, my mother must have put the comfort on me. She has not seen anything. But based on the feeling, the experience, she realizes, Oh, my mother is here. Similarly for us, because we are spiritually asleep right now, we can't perceive Krishna's presence. But when we strive to remember Him, when we strive to practice bhakti and chant His holy names, hear His kirtans, hear His katha, or do His puja, at that time, by that, we start feeling an inner sense of comfort, an inner sense of calmness, an inner sense of clarity. The problems of this world are causing us to get agitated. And as we remember Krishna, we start feeling peace. And when we feel this peace, we have not seen Krishna, but that sensation of peace is our experience of Krishna. Just like for that baby, the stopping of the shivering, the feeling of warmth, that is the sense, that, oh, that is the indicator of the mother's love, mother's presence and mother's love. Similarly, for each one of us, if we strive to remember Krishna, we will experience that calmness. We will experience some clarity, some security. And that is, we need to infer with the eyes of knowledge given by scripture. We infer by that, this is actually Krishna's presence. And as we keep practicing bhakti more and more, then we will also realize that this presence is so enriching for me that I don't need other things. Not that I don't care for other things, but I don't need them as a source of my self-identity. 
the go in the Gopi Gita it is said, Nija Jana Smaya Smita. The Gopi say that if your devotees become proud any time, Krishna will just smile and their pride goes away. Now what does that mean? It means that when Krishna smiles, at that time the devotee beholds Krishna's smile and gets so much pleasure through that. And the devotee thinks, why do I need this pride business? I doing so many things to get some pleasure by somebody appreciating me. But why do I need this? This beholding Krishna is so, so joyful. I said, I said, I don't need this. So that way, the pride decreases. Dhamsana Smita. Now about 20-25 years ago, when I was introduced to Bhakti, uh, through the study of the Bhagavad Gita, before that, I had been studying uh, to come to the West, to come to America. I gave my GRE in my third year engineering. And at that time, I got, it was out of 2400, so I got 2350. So I was first in the whole state of Maharashtra. Throughout my life, my goal in life was to be a topper. And I was always among the good students, but sometimes I was second, third, fourth, sometimes joined first, never the first. <laughs> and that was my dream throughout my life. And when I got this GRE score, my dream had been fulfilled. I was so happy. But after a few hours, I got that letter by mail telling me about the marks. At that time, I didn't have email. So, after that, I realized just looking at this mark sheet doesn't give much pleasure. So it's only when people congratulate, oh, you've done so well. That's when you get some pleasure. And somehow it happened that one, uh, that one, three of my close friends, one after another, they forgot to congratulate me. <laughs> it, it was, I don't think it was any negative intention. I thought everybody knows about it. Everybody is congratulating. Why to congratulate? They all know about it. So when the first friend didn't congratulate, I was a little annoyed. The second friend didn't congratulate, I was angered. My third friend didn't I was infuriated. I, I still controlled myself and I was about to... Now, how do you tell someone, why are you not congratulating me? <laughs> <laughs> so you can't even speak anything at that time. <laughs> so I was just so angered. And the third time when it happened, it just struck me, I sort of looked at myself from above. But hey, you did all this to become happy. You thought that by coming first, you'll become happy in life. But here, instead of becoming happy, you simply become more dependent for your happiness on others. That, earlier you could just meet with people and talk with them, but now there is this overpowering need. So at that time it struck me, that tomorrow I can give another exam, I can get, again try to get good marks. But where is this going to end? Where, when is, I still be more dependent on others for my happiness. That was the time when I got the Bhagavad Gita uh, from a friend and I started reading it. And in the sixth chapter, in the 22nd verse, I read about the fruit of absorption in Krishna. It says, when you become absorbed in Krishna, Yam Labdhva Chaparam Lavam Manyate Nadhikam Tata Yasmin Sthitam Dukkena Gurunapi Vichayate So once we become absorbed in Krishna, then we don't crave for anything else. And then even if distresses come, we are not shattered by those distresses. Na Vichayate So at that time it struck me, this is the real achievement in life. If I can achieve this, then there will be no more craving, no more lamenting. Be absorbed. So, of course, I am still on the journey towards that. But, the point which I made is that, through this, is that this understanding that external validation, it's simply an endless and often fruitless journey. We all need to get internal validation. Internal validation means that comes by our spiritual growth. Now, of course, we have association of devotees, we have association of people around us, and we have a role and a responsibility in the world. We do have to act in those roles and responsibilities properly. 
but we don't let our sense of self identity and self worth come from that that yeah even if tomorrow i am to, today i am respected and so on person tomorrow that respect is not there that may change my situation that doesn't change my identity i'm always a part of krishna and if i can connect with krishna i can experience shelter and security in that and then we all have been given certain gifts with those gifts we can work we can we can and should work we can make and should make contributions and they may give us some appreciation also but we don't crave for it we don't depend on it for our self worth so so our gifts whatever we have if we use them we use them in a mood of service to krishna krishna you give me this gift i will use it and if i get some praise for that yes i'm grateful for that but that is not when i don't get it i'm doing this in the mood of service to you so this vertical connection that we have we can develop it internally through the practice of bhakti and we can also develop it externally by using whatever talents we have whatever resources we have in a mood of service to krishna so we have family we have jobs we work in the we work diligently but in the mood of service to krishna and if the success comes in that we get some appreciation for that that's good that doesn't come if you are working in a mood of service to krishna then even through those activities our vertical connection will grow and we will develop spiritually by that so to have gifts is <clears throat> to have gifts is good to know that we have gifts is better still but to know that our gifts to have ability is good to have uh, to recognize that we have ability is better still but to recognize that our abilities are gifts that is the best thing because when we recognize our abilities are gifts we will use them nicely we won't but we won't become proud of them we won't become agitated if some of the results are not coming so these are gifts given by krishna let me use them in his service so that's by internally connecting with krishna and externally using our gifts in a mood of service to krishna we'll find that gradually that internal connection with krishna that spiritual connection with krishna will give us a satisfaction that can get us off the ride of pride so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the theme of how pride can take us on a dangerous ride on a perilous ride we started by explaining how krishna when talking about the ungodly qualities he mentions thrice the some quality related with pride ambho darpa and abhiman pride can have a positive connotation when it refers to honor a sense of honor and which makes us act honorably but pride has a negative connotation when when pride makes us go beyond boundaries in acting in every relationship there are bonds and there are boundaries so the demoniac people the people who are not wise but otherwise they basically go beyond boundaries like ram did when trying to get sita and growth is natural the desire for growth is also natural but cancer is unnatural because it is disproportionate and destructive so when the desire for appreciation and recognition which is natural when it becomes disproportionate and destructive when it makes us give up our boundaries in terms of civilized behavior that is when it becomes dangerous and the trashtra spent his whole life fighting battle that he had already lost he couldn't get the kingdom and he just kept craving for it and duryodhan was the trashtra was the consenting villain duryodhan shakuni was the scheming villain and duryodhan trashtra was the sorry duryodhan was the active active or executing villain so uh, here duryodhan represents he had this pride which was what made him not just gain not be satisfied with his own kingdom but not just gain the pandavas kingdom but gain all of it satva means let us share equally rajas means i want the biggest share tamas means i want everything so he he tried to dishonor and disrupt draupadi not because of lust but again because of pride i can humiliate you so much and this pride how do we deal with it talked about it pride arises from insecurity 
Duryodhan had been the center of the eyes of the community. And then when he found that it was all taken by the center of the state by Pandavas, then he couldn't tolerate it. So uh, when we analyze these anarthas, they are psychological uh, categories. So in literal life, we have to recognize the nuances, shade lines, border lines when which will fall where. But essentially, uh, Duryodhan's pride made him hostile even towards Krishna. The other anarthas make us feel the need for Krishna. But pride makes us feel I don't need Krishna. That's why it can be the most dangerous. And to deal with it, we have to address the inner insecurity. And insecurity comes because we have wedded our sense of self-worth to something external to us. So if we think our self-worth is equal to our net worth, self-worth is equal to our CGPA score or whatever, then we will be very insecure. But if you understand that my self-worth comes from the fact that Krishna is always with me and Krishna loves me, that vertical relationship is the basis of my self-worth. And how do we know that Krishna loves us? It's like a baby knows when the cold is removed by so suddenly the baby understands my mother has put this comfort on me. Similarly, when we practice bhakti and remember Krishna, we experience calmness, clarity. That is an indicator of Krishna's presence and love for us. So internally, by the practice of bhakti yoga, we can develop that connection with Krishna. And externally, by seeing the abilities that we have as gifts and using them in a mode of service to Krishna, then we won't be dependent for appreciation on others. Rather, we will do in a mode of service. If we get appreciation, it's good. If we don't get it, still we grow in our devotion. To have abilities is good. To recognize that we have abilities is better. To recognize that our abilities are gifts is the best. And Bhakti helps us to get that sense of self-worth both by our internal connection with Krishna and by our external contribution for Krishna. And thus we can free ourselves from pride. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So are there any questions or comments? I think I answered your question about was so what Duryodhan motivated by the desire for revenge? As I said, that the desire for revenge also arose from an inner insecurity. So this was an, I was entitled to be the sinosure of all eyes. Why had they become the sinosure? And that was from pride that had been wounded. So that's how that wounded pride led to envy. And that envy eventually led to all kinds of terrible schemes which he did. And eventually he, he felt that the Pandavas had dishonored me, that Draupadi had dishonored me. And he wanted to take revenge. Now, Draupadi had no particular intention to dishonor him any time. This it happened circumstantially whenever it happened. And uh, he felt dishonored by that. And he tried, sought revenge for, for it. So even there is a uh, there's a often quoted incident that when in the Maya uh, in the Sabha, Maya Sabha, Duryodhan slipped on some land which was watery, but he didn't recognize it to be watery. So at that time, Draupadi is attributed to have said that Andheka Veta Andha, that the son of a blind person is blind. But actually, the Mahabharata does not give any record of this. The critical edition of the Mahabharata, which has been made by scholars looking at whatever words in the Mahabharata we have, the Draupadi has never spoken a statement like this. So yes, the, the Pandavas and Draupadi, they all saw and they all laughed when uh, he did that. But that laughter was not malicious. That laughter was just funny. To, to, that was just out of fun. And he, he could have just brushed it off. You know, people, people, sometimes people just... See, normally if somebody falls, we, we will want to help them. But if somebody is normally known to be very arrogant and proud, and then they fall, it's, 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 just, it's just normal human nature. It's funny. You, know, you think you're so great and just see you fell down. <coughs> so it is not that the Pandavas were making a mockery of him. It is just fun. Yes, we could say that they could have avoided it. But in the dynamics of the relationships which they had, it was definitely not malicious. But he pursued it like that and he sought revenge for that. But there was no word spoken of that kind where he was 
labeled in terms of his his father or anything like that. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, can you talk after the class personally? Okay. We have some time. I think anything related with the class we'll discuss now. Yeah. You talked about Ravana's desire to have Sita was not right. right? I was reading or rather hearing there was this demon called Drumala who, who had this desire to enjoy with the wife of Maharaj Pugrasi. And then when he did that act, he came in the in the form of Pugrasi, Maharaj Pugrasi. And then he said, for us, the it's 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 there is no the rules and conducts of human does not apply to us. So for, from human points, I understand, and in general, it's it's, it's it's bad whatever he did. But how to understand when these demons say like this, like all these rules does not apply to us? How to understand it in context of Rama in particular? Okay. Well, if there is some story where uh, Drumala came in the form of Ograsen, or assume the form of Ograsen and tried to uh, try to cohabit with his wife. So, at that time, I would say that, first of all, you have to look at where the story comes. And uh, if at all the stories, because many of the Puranas and Tihasas, some interpolations have come in them. Generally, we can't just look at a story, we have to look which scripture, whether it's actually there and if you go and check in that scripture, whether it's actually there. And especially if it has been quoted and addressed by an Acharya, because something like this is quite provocative. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be very strongly in uh, violation of the normal conceptions of Dharma that we have. So surely, the Acharyas would ad have addressed this, because they have also studied the scriptures. So if they are not addressed it, it uh, logical inference could be that it was not present in the scriptures when the scriptures when they wrote the scriptures when they read the scriptures. So it could have been added at other times. Generally, those books on which commentaries have been written, like the Bhagavad Gita, even in Sanskrit there are hundreds of commentaries. So when commentaries are written, the, whoever writes the commentary, their followers preserve the commentary, and along with that, the original book also gets preserved. But those books on which commentaries have not been written, then those books are not preserved that much. And that's why some verses can be added somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, it, we have to check whether this is an interpolation. But even if it's not an interpolation, still, it is <coughs> to say that the rules of the demons, ru rules of human society don't apply to us. Now, in general, if we consider there is the godly society, human society, and there's the demoniac society. So now in the demoniac society, certain rules may be a little more relaxed. In the sense that there are certain things which are not allowed in human society which will be allowed over there. But those rules, they may they can interact with other demons that way. If they're interacting with humans, taking on the garb of a human being, then that is uh, that is improper. That is improper, because in human society, as they say, do in Rome as Romans do. You know, and if you say that, okay, I come from India, we drive the car in a particular, in our one side of the road, and I come to America, I say, I'm an Indian, so I'll drive on the same side of the road. Mm -hmm. And the police will come and say, get out of the road. Yeah. <laughs> That's the least they will say. <laughs> <laughs> they will put us in jail also, give us a ticket, whatever. So. So we have to act in whichever society we are acting, that's how we need to act. We have to follow the rules of that particular society. That's why when Arjun went to the Swarga Loka, and this was the argument that Urvashi gave to him. Arjun said to Urvashi that, you know, I, can, I cannot unite with you. So Urvashi said, no, no, don't worry, he said that. No, these rules don't apply to us. He said, oh, no, I see you like my mother. Because you have united with Pururava, who is my ancestor. So oh, he said, I cannot unite with you. She felt, no, oh, these rules don't apply. She said, no, no, but I, I cannot change my vision of you. So when Arjun went to the uh, Swarga Loka, he did not actually simply arbitrarily start adopting the rules of Swarga Loka and acting that way. Mm -hmm. So he did not. So he, <coughs> so when he went to Swarga Loka, he knew he was a human being. So he acted in a way that was proper for him. 
So that means even for the Swarga Vasis and Swarga Loka, he can act in the particular, they can act in the particular ways. But for those who are human beings in human society, they have to act in the particular way. When the demon comes in human society, if he is acting in a demoniac way, he says, this is the way I always act, so here also I'll act like that. But then the problem with that would be, why, is he have to, why does he have to impersonate him? Why does he take the form of Ugrasin and come, as in the story itself? And another point is, it doesn't apply that way to Ravan, because uh, Ravan did not just uh, try to cohabit with Sita, he abducted Sita. He took Sita away for himself. And if you say Ravana's wrongs were many, first of all, he took on the garb of a sage for his own, very, he took on the garb of a holy person for extremely unholy purposes. That itself is an offense. Second is that he hatched a whole scheme by which somebody like Jatayu was victimized and slaughtered eventually. Even Maricha was slaughtered for that. Maricha had to be killed for that. And then on top of that, he did not follow the Kshatriya code. He did not confront Ram directly. That is a cowardly act. That is what Jatayu told him. And this is, you are a coward basically. So we can, I would say that these particular ideas of uh, somebody saying these are our rules and we will apply them. When they speak like this, it is often they using, using but what they speak is not necessarily standard philosophy, it's not the standard dharma also. When a demon is quoting some shast, quoting some dharmic code, is that actually the code of dharma? See, for example, in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Hiranyakashipu says that if we destroy all the Yangishalas on the earth, if we assert the position of the gods, then the result of that will be, all these are what nourish Vishnu, Yagya nourishes Vishnu. When you stop Yagya, then Vishnu will not be nourished and then Vishnu will die. This is in the Bhagavatam. And he is speaking it. Yeah. But is it true? No. <laughs> no. So we have to see in, in general what is the conclusion of scripture. And whatever is given in scripture, if it doesn't harmonize with the conclusion of scripture, then we have to hold it at some level of skepticism. And this applies not just to the words of demons, even to the words of Krishna. In the Govardhan Leela, when Krishna tells the Vrajivasis, actually if you do good karma, Indra has to give rains. Uh, we don't need to worship him separately. That is karma vimamsa. But Krishna is speaking some words and we don't accept Krishna's words also. Why? Because Krishna in a particular context may speak certain things which may not be in harmony with the conclusion of scripture. Only the context was like this. Uh, so let's talk personally yeah. about this after our class. Okay. So essentially the point is that we cannot take demons' words as authoritative. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk here. Okay. So you can talk. Uh,